welcome to our 40 day plan <laughs> well I'm laughing because I got taken by surprise <laughs> I wasn't even ready okay so we carry now with our plan the 40 day plan we call it a new life and as usual we are getting along slowly guess what today is day 22 really excited and really really happy with everyone who's been watching the program because um i see all the comments on youtube and instagram we absolutely appreciate you and we love the fact that you're working with us and going on this journey with us uh, but before we even go anywhere deeper today i just thought let me read a little bit about this guy who wrote this book because um so far we just talked about it we said book by rick warren purpose driven life and we don't say anything more about it um the purpose driven life um will help you understand why you are alive and reveal god's amazing plan for you both here and now and for eternity rick warren will guide you through a personal 40 day spiritual journey that will transform your answers um your answer to life's most important question what on earth am I here for? Knowing God's purpose for creating you will reduce your stress, we focus your energy, we simplify your decisions, and we give meaning to your life, and most importantly, prepare you for eternity. And this is from the Time magazine telling us what this book contains, and I absolutely agree with them. More information or more things by other people is movie stars and political leaders aren't the only ones turning to requiring for spiritual guidance uh, millions of people from nba and lpga players to corporate exec to corporate executives to high school students to prison inmates meet regularly to discuss the purpose driven life and that's again time magazine so when i write things like this i was really excited because again we are meeting constantly to talk about this book to review what this book contains and how it affects our life this is another review. It says the, promise, the premise that true purpose in life is found not in self-absorption but through faith in action rings true. It rings true. Warren's message um, is assailable, unassailable, and that was from the Wall Street Journal. So when you pick up this book and you start reading it, things start to open up in your life. And that's the, the biggest reason I chose this for us to, to look at together because um it's not enough for us to chase so many things in life without uh taking time out to understand what they, why why do we do it what's the reason we do the things we do and it was one of those reasons that pushed me here and we've talked about this several times um but today again i want to thank everybody that subscribed to our youtube channel we really really appreciate you and we absolutely understand um or oh, appreciate the fact that you working with us on this unique journey that we're going on because i know when we started this whole channel it was all about um the creative skills and working with our hands and doing different things um, but as time went on we realized that there's so much more to life and it's not just skills it's also what goes into our head and from the head comes what the hands could do and that's why i i decided to throw in more and more into the channel but all of you out there who've been following us and subscribed to us and being part of us, we absolutely appreciate you. And without you, we won't be doing what we do because the more we realize that we're actually contributing to you, the more we feel we have to carry on and do more. And this is just one of the more ways of, you know, keeping you, you know, energized, keeping you going, keeping you active, keeping you powerful and empowered, whichever words you want to think of. We want the best for you, and that's why we do all the things we do. So, thank you. Okay, so today we're going to carry on. Today is day 22. Like I said, we're halfway, and we're excited because we are gradually getting there. Looks like it's going to be one of those long chapters. So, we really, really want you, especially people on live with us on Instagram, stay with us because you get a lot of message from this. Don't just run in and run out. You run in and run out, you miss out. But of course, if you miss out, go on YouTube. It's all there okay so day 22 what are we looking at it says created to become like christ that's the title we're created to become like christ and that was quite an exciting message for me just 
reading the title. He said, God know what he was doing from the very beginning. He decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love him along the same lines as the life of his son. So he shaped our life just like the life of his son, Jesus Christ. And remember, we're created to be like him. So we see the original and intended shape of our lives there in him. So the original reason for our life is in Jesus Christ. And this was in Romans 8, verse 29. We look at this son and see God's original purpose in everything created. And this is Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. So those are the two verses he gives us. Remember sometimes he gives us verses to look at before we get into the book. So those are the two verses. So we're getting into the book now. We were created to be like Christ. From the very beginning, God's plan has been to make us like his son, Jesus Christ. This is our destiny and the third purpose of our life. And when I read that be the third purpose of our life, I thought, oh, have we done the first purpose and the second purpose? So I quickly went and checked and just a quick ref uh, reflection. The first purpose is we are planned for God's pleasure. The second purpose is we are formed for God's family. And the third purpose is the purpose we are looking at today. We were created to become like Christ. So you see how the purposes are going. So from the very beginning, God's plan has been to make us like his son, Jesus Christ. And this is our destiny and the third purpose of our life. God announced this intention at creation. Then God said, we're quoting God now. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image and likeness. In our creation, only human beings are made in God's image. This is a great privilege and gives us dignity as beings because we are the only ones that are created in God's image. We don't know the meaning of what the phrase covers, the phrase created in God's image covers, but we know some of it. And that includes, like God, we are spiritual beings. Now I want us to just keep responding on chatting with us. Do what, whatever you need to do. Because remember, we see here and we are happy to share with you. We want you to share with us whatever your thoughts are. If anything we've done so far up to chapter 22 is making sense to you and something is happening in your life, please feel free to share with us. Because you know I share with you and I'll be telling you as we go along. So, like God, we are spiritual beings. Our, spiritual, our spirits are immortal and we outlast our earthly bodies. So very important, remember, yes, we come and go, but the spirit in us is eternal. It will not go anywhere, it's there. The body may go, but the spirit remains. We are intellectual, we can think, we can reason, and we can solve problems. Again, remember this whole thing is about telling us how we are like Christ. Like God, we are relational. Relational is a very good one. It means we have relationship. We have relationship. We do not live in isolation. And we can give and we can receive real love. He says we can give love and we can receive love. And these are, he's just trying to explain the things that makes us different, that makes us like God. Remember, like God, we are relational. Uh, someone just asked how many times within the week do we do this? Um, what it is is we have this book. Where's the book? We have this book that we're looking at and it's called The, the Purpose Driven Life. And it has 40 chapters, which is 40 uh, times we are planning on reading them to you. So um, what we've done is we do them when we are able to do them. We don't do them daily. Because when we try, we tried doing them daily, we were really compressed for time and, you know, I needed to review it, then I needed to read it, and then I needed to come out and sit down and chat with you about it. So then, of course, with my daily activities, it became just too much for us to take on. So we break them in between. We don't, we can't really tell the exact day we come on, but we do come on and the plan is we're going to come on until we finish the book. And we're trying our best to make sure that we we stay very close together like 
at least two days apart not not daily but two days apart so thank you for for the question so like god we are relational beings we have relationships we do not live in isolation we can give and we can receive real love we have a moral conscience we can discern right from wrong which makes us accountable to our maker and so all of these things are the things that make us stand out these are the things that make us close to god so is here i'm coming to bring my own understanding so when it comes to discerning right from wrong this is where it gets tricky as human beings because most of us as humans um we may think we know what is right and we do it but sometimes we may be doing something and we're actually stepping on somebody else's toes so most of the times we don't understand what is right from wrong and you find that some people they naturally destroy their conscience so in the process of doing something they may be hurting someone and they don't really care they just carry on with it but ideally as humans we should be able to know right from wrong and simply don't they simply don't care what they do to other people and how they hurt them and a good example of this one is again like uh, if you've been carrying on with us I like talking about us in Africa. The, what goes on there, we have, we have countries that we have leaders who are absolutely, they don't, care, they don't have any conscience at all. And so what they do, they go in there and they embezzle money that belongs to the state, belongs to the government, and they just cut it all away and send it to foreign countries. While the citizens are struggling and, you know, in pain and they lack and there's no health services, there are no, no infrastructures and everybody is suffering the people in power don't care and they're taking all the money away and they live in absolute luxury and so when we have been told here that as human we should know right from wrong these people don't know right from wrong they just they just behave the way they like and so um that that wasn't the intention of god he wanted us to know right from wrong so here it says the Bible says all people created, not just Christian, not just believers. We all possess part of the image of God in us. So remember, we're created in the image of God. And this is why killing people is wrong. Because if you have the image of God in you and God created you, why would you want to go kill another person? And so this again, you probably could be looking at it in cases of war. What, what leads to war? What makes people make the decision that, yes, let's go to war? And then when you go to war, what happens? People get killed. So the image of God in man became incomplete and has been damaged and has been distorted by sin. And this answers it. This answers why some people have destroyed their conscience that they don't feel anything anymore about anyone. And this is why God sent Jesus on a mission to restore the image of God that we lost. So again, for us to Christians and believers, we know that Jesus was sent to restore us back to God. Because remember, the, we were created in God's image and everything went wrong. So then God sent Jesus to restore us back to his glory. So what will the full image and likeness of God look like? That's the question he's asking us. It looks like Jesus Christ. So the image of God looks like Jesus Christ. Bible says Jesus is the exact likeness of God. The invisible image of the invisible God. So God is invisible. But Jesus came and became visible. So if we want to see what God is like, then we should be looking at Jesus because that's the visible image of God in our midst. And the exact representation of his being. So when Jesus came, he became the exact representation of God in our midst. So we often use the phrase like father, like son to refer to family resemblance. So most times when you see a son, you say, oh yeah, that son looks exactly like that. That's what we should be looking at in the case of Jesus. So when people see your likeness in your children, it brings you joy. And that's exactly what God likes. He likes the fact that Jesus gave a perfect um, representation of him god wants us his children to bear his image and likeness too so while we were created in god's image he wants us to have his image in us as well and because as a parent you are excited when your child looks like you that's exactly how god is excited when we look like him bible says you were created to be like god truly 
righteous and holy. So God created us to be like him, to be righteous, to be holy. Let's be clear, we will never become like God or become a God because you hear people that say, oh yeah, he is a demigod. And you hear all that kind of thing going on all the time. But we're never going to be a God. This is prideful lie when we um, start equating ourselves with our creator. It is Satan's oldest temptation. And you remember um, when Jesus when Jesus was being tempted by, by, by Satan, he said, if you are truly the son of God, why don't you order the angels to come down? Why don't you fall down and worship me? And then order the angels. So some, he should fall down. And then the angels will come and hold him. So he's always after anything that will make us argue with him and fight with him and say, no, you're lying or whatever. So that is for us to understand that whenever we start having this pride in us and we think we're so great, that that's Satan working in us. He promised Adam and Eve, and this was Satan again, he promised Adam and Eve that if they followed his advice, he said to them, you shall be like God. Many, and, and this man is reminding us, many other religions and philosophies promote this lie, and they tell us that we can be divine and we can be God. That that's not true. We shouldn't even start thinking in that direction. This wish, this dream, these desires show up, show up in us every time we try to control circumstances. Every time we try to control our future. Every time we try to control people around us. This is because at such times we become as dictators. And if you look around you or you go into history, you would have heard of so many dictators over time who all they ever wanted to do was control everyone under them. And what came out of scenarios like that always, always goes wrong. As creatures, we will never become the creator. That's a big message. As people who have been created, we will never be the creator. God doesn't want us to become a God. He wants us to be godly. God wants us to be godly, not a God. By taking on his values, by taking on his attitudes, and by taking on his character. So that's what God wants from us. He wants us to be godly people, not try to be God. The Bible says, take on an entirely new way of life. A God-fashioned life. A life renewed from the inside and working itself into your conduct as God accurately reproduces his character in you. Bible is telling us we should take on all this so that God will recreate his character in us. God's ultimate goal for, goal for our life on earth is not comfort, but character development. So it gets more and more interesting now. We're beginning to see one of his ultimate goals for, for us on this earth. Remember the big question, what on earth am I here for? It's not, it's not for comfort. It's for us to get God's character. He wants us to grow up spiritually and become like Jesus Christ. So can we grow up spiritually and be ready to be like God's son? Becoming like Christ does not mean losing your personality or becoming a mindless clone. Now, God is not expecting us to be a clone of Jesus. You know what clone is? When you become a replica of that thing. No, he doesn't want us to be that. He wants us to become like him. It does not mean we should lose who we are. We should lose our personality. God created your uniqueness. So he certainly doesn't want to destroy who we are. Remember God created us. So he doesn't want to destroy the personalities that we are. Christ likeness is all about transforming our character, not our personality. So what characters did Christ have? That's where we're going to now. It's not about changing the person in us. God wants us to develop the kind of character described in the Beatitudes of Jesus. The fruit of the Spirit. That's one of them. Paul's great chapter on love. He wants us to look at that. Peter's list of the characteristics of an effective and productive life. These are the things that we need to be looking at. Every time we forget that character is one of God's purpose for our lives, 
we will become frustrated by our circumstances. So every time we find that we're not looking at our character, we will become frustrated. Happening to me, we'll be asking, why is this happening to me? Why am I having such a difficult time? That will happen because our character is not what it's meant to be. We should be aiming to create a perfect character. One answer is that life is supposed to be difficult. So if you find yourself struggling with life, and now you're asking, why am I struggling? Why aren't things the way I want them to be? You see, one of the biggest answers is we should know that life is meant to be difficult. And I know one of the first chapters when we started, he reminded us clearly that life is a test. And so when things start to happen, out of your control, out of your understanding, the biggest thing which you understand is life itself is a test. This is what enables us to grow. And it reminds us that we should remember that life, this life we have is not eternity. This is why we don't last here forever. And this is why we pass on or we die physically. So the physical body goes and then the spirit then moves on. On this note, I would talk a bit about some of the people I encounter on social media. And th this is an exciting one because today I'm wearing one of my lovely blonde wigs. If you've been following my channel, you know I wear various different... I just love wearing wigs. It's one of my favorite things. Because I can, I can be who I want to be and be comfortable in whatever I want to be in. That's my choice. And it's my personality. I've talked about it in this program. It's one of the best things this man has also brought our attention to. The fact that we can be creating unity in our communities without all being uniform. Because that's what's going on. He's reminded us clearly here, we shouldn't, we can be like Christ's character, but we are not going to change our personality to be that. And then I got people, <coughs> Picking on me because I'm wearing a blonde wig. What's blonde wig got to do with message I'm getting across to you or sharing with you? People want to change people to suit themselves. And the minute you start to do that, what you become is a dictator. You want people to blend into the personality that you want. You want people to be created like you want to be. That's not what life is about. We don't want to all be uniform. We want to be individuals. We want to be personalities that God have, has created. And in all my dealings on my channel, I have never tried to be somebody else. I am just who I am. And I am proud of the person that God has made me. So it was just for people to understand that, especially us black people, I love my people and I, I promote everything black. But whenever something goes slightly out of what they are expecting, we pull it so so far away. We pull it so much into our culture. I mean, one of my biggest videos, it's on um, a braid that I did on, on, on a Caucasian person, a white person. And that video has the highest comments ever. What are the comments about? Absolute hatred. I don't know how braids on a human being dictates what the person is. I don't, I don't get it. Because my big question would be, if we're so concerned about um, people should not do what you do or what you think is your culture, then question is, what are we doing in European countries, if you ask me? Let's all go back to African countries. Why are we here? If we don't want to fit in, if, we're not, if we don't want to blend in with other races, why are we here? Why are we not woken up to the fact that, yes, slavery happened, but it happened. And it happened at a time when we, that we are here today, we are not there. So the best thing we can do our, to our great-great-grandparents is to show them that we've, stu we've stood strong enough to take on life and move on to the future and create great things for our own children to come. And not to keep, there's something I call it, I call it, you know, create history, don't live history. 
Creating history is about you doing something that makes you stand out, that gives you something that people can refer to in the, in the future as well. People should look back and say, look at that woman, this is what she did for, for herself in her own time. That's history you have created. Living history is like living in the past constantly. Because people need to wake up and look at ways that can help to promote who they are. Look at ways that can help them to support other people. What I'm doing here, reading this book, is a way of helping people to see themselves and wake up for whatever issues they're struggling with. I have been struggling with a lot of issues. And that's why I chose to share this message with all of you. And one of the people I listened to, Eckhart Tolle, in one of his books, this book, whoops, A New Life. And one of the things he calls it, he calls it pain body. As black people, we carry a lot of pain body. We should wake up and face the new life. In the sense of, we've got people like Barack Obama who's ruled America. We've got people like Oprah Winfrey. We've got people like uh, Jay-Z and Beyonce. These are people who have stood and fought their own grounds in their own life. Time people move on and find their own grounds in life than looking at culture and hiding under it when they want to be, when they want to be, uh, what would I call it? Some people say haters. I don't want to use that word. They are absolute Satan. Because what, what I told this particular person who was picking on nonsense issues about blonde wigs, I don't know where you're coming from. Because the message I'm getting across to you has absolutely nothing to do with what I look like. Anyway, thank you. Someone there absolutely said beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. And yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. She says, I'm a beautiful person. Thank you. Because beauty, yes, is in the, in the eyes of the beholder. Is one of the things I also noted as well. Like, there was a time we had, um, the Daily Mail had a poll. And they claimed that black women are the ugliest women in the world. And the, everybody was attacking them. Like, what, what, what parameter are you using to create this ugly? That's what we need to know. The person who sees the beauty sees it. And you cannot go into that person's eye and say, no, what you're seeing is wrong. It is down to you to decide in your head if you think you are beautiful or not. And I know I'm beautiful. So it's for you to sit down and accept who you are than to keep looking at what people wear and what people don't wear. So anyway, we're going to move on from that. Um, so... This book is trying to teach us to be, to create unity in our lives and not to become uniform. So when people try to pull you to look the image they want you to look like, they are trying to make you uniform because they want to conform you to their standards of what beauty should be. And that's one thing you should resist at all times. Be your own person. Remember we're all created by one God and he created us in our unique ways and he has his reasons why he did that he loves variety so why then do people expect everyone to conform to one standard oh i've talked about that one so many christians misinterpret jesus promise of the abundant life to mean perfect health this is a good one that we're going to look at now it says most of us christians we misunderstand jesus's promise of abundant life to mean perfect health comfortable lifestyle constant happiness full realization of our dreams instant relief from problems through faith and prayer that's what we think abundant life means and when i read this i was so happy because that's not what it is that's not what it is all of us on a daily basis we just think that Whenever we, we pray to God, this is what we want from us. We're going to get to it because this is quite an interesting one. He said in one word, not just Christians, but everyone expects life to be easy. All of us expect life to be easy. We expect even more. Even as Christians, we expect heaven on earth. All of us. That's what we wake up to, to, to expect on a daily basis. But this self-absorbed perspective treats God as a genie. 
So whenever we have this expectation, we're treating God as a genie. You know the story of the genie, where whenever he tapped on it, anything he asked, the genie will provide for him. He said, we, we expect God to be a genie who simply exists to serve us in selfish pursuits. Selfish pursuits of personal fulfillment. So whenever we have any unique need, boom, God will answer it and give it to me. Because that's the kind of God I have. Because he said he will give me abundant life. God is not our servant. That's a big message here. God is not our servant. Think about it. When you have a servant, whatever you just, you, you utter something, he provides it. You utter something, he provides it. And then when I thought about this, it clicked in my head. It's like, okay, as a parent, is it everything your child wants that you give to them? No. So this should also bring to us that it's not everything we want from God, who is our father, that he should give us because he sees bigger than we see. He knows better than we know. So sometimes when we're asking for something, he knows that that thing is not going to bring us good. And so sometimes when we don't get answers to the things we ask for, we shouldn't go getting angry and say, God didn't answer our prayer. That's what this is leading to. So it's reminding us that God is not our servant. He's not a genie that anything we ask, he will hand over to us. If we fall for the idea that life is supposed to be easy, either we become severely disillusioned or we live in denial of reality. That was absolutely spot on and I love this. If we have this illusion that life is supposed to be easy, we are either disillusioned or we are in denial of reality. We should never forget that life is not about us. Remember I just read the purpose of life. We are here for God's pleasure, not the other way around. We exist for God's purposes, not vice versa. Why would God provide heaven and earth when he planned eternity somewhere else? And that's why when we pass on, we pass on. Because there's somewhere else we go to. So why should everything happen here? That's the question he's asking us. God gives us our time on earth to build our strength on our character. That's the whole reason of it. He gives us this time to build our character. And the character is built for eternity. It is the Holy Spirit's job to produce Christ-like characters in us. Bible says, as the Spirit of the Lord walks within us, we become more and more like Him and reflect His glory even more. This process is called sanctification. The process of changing us to be more like Jesus Christ. And this is the third purpose of our life which was today's purpose. We cannot reproduce the character of Jesus on our own strength. We can't do that. So the New Year resolutions we make, the willpowers we have, the best intentions that we have, all of them, none of them are good enough to get us looking like or behaving like Jesus Christ. On the Holy Spirit, only the Holy Spirit has the power to make and change, to make the changes God wants to make in our lives. Only the Holy Spirit has that power. The Bible says God is working in us, giving us the desire to obey him and the power to do what pleases him. Mention the power of the Holy Spirit and most of us think of miraculous demonst demonstrations and intense emotions. So whenever we say Holy Spirit, people are just thinking wild thoughts. Miracles is going to happen now. He says, no, that's not how it is. He says, most of the time, the Holy Spirit's power is released in our lives in quiet, unassuming ways that we aren't aware or can't even feel it. The Holy Spirit is working in us constantly to the point that even we are not feeling it. He said, he often nudges us with a gentle whisper. And I know Lots of people have asked me, but how does God speak to you? How does God? I've never had God speak to me. We have voices in our head. From time to time, we hear something. Now, the whisper, the one that's not loud, that's not stressing you, that's not harassing you, 
That's the one. That's the Holy Spirit. That's the one that leads you right. That's the one that doesn't judge you, but is reminding you. Some people call it a gut feeling. That's the one. The one that knows what is best for you. Christ likeness is not produced by imitation, but by inhabitation. This means we allow Christ to live through us. So Christ lives through us. For this is the secret. Christ lives in us. The Holy Spirit also lives in us. 